Hello, this is John Whitaker for the Graduate Level Probability class, and this is our first video lecture. Now, I'm very excited to be starting this class today, and uh, we're going to look at some basic constructions that are involved uh, in probability, uh, the definition of a probability, find out that in many cases, uh, probabilities are computed by counting, and look at a little bit of a counting techniques or uh, sometimes some complicated uh, scenarios. So let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> First thing I want to do is give a definition. And so <clears throat> we're going to talk about a random experiment. So what is a random experiment? A random experiment. is an experiment in which the outcome is dependent on chance. The outcome is not fixed. So it's examples. You could say uh, a coin is tossed. That's a random experiment. When you toss a coin, you know you're either going to get heads or tails, but on that individual coin toss, you don't know which one of those you're going to get. Another example is that a die is rolled. So these are simple examples. So that's a random experiment. Again, your uh, outcomes for a six-sided die number would be one through six, but you don't know on an individual die roll which one of those numbers is going to turn up. So those are random examples of random experiments. Look, the next thing that I want to talk about is a sample space. So the sample space. is the set of all possible outcomes. Oh, the experience. So let's look at the sample space for our two examples. So if we have an example that coin is tossed, then the sample space and I'll denote it by script S is script S is equal to well, it's a set, and I'm just going to symbolize the outcomes by H and T for heads and tails. Our other example, so you have a die is rolled. Then the sample space is script S equal to the outcomes are the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. So that's its sample space. Next thing I want to do is define an event.
So uh, an event from a random experiment. is a subset of the sample space. So any sub-collections of possible outcomes is called an event. Okay, so uh, let's look at an example. So let's suppose that our random experiment is that a die is broken. Then e sub one equal to let's say two, four, and six is an event. So e, e sub one is an event because it's a subspace or subset, I should say, not subspace. It's a subset of uh, the sample space. As a matter of fact, this event for a die being rolled. Yeah, this event is the, uh, the event of getting an even number. Another example, also uh, E2, E sub 2, equal to 3, 4, 5, or 6 is an event when a die is rolled. So this is a subset of the sample sp uh, space. And really, what this event is for a die roll is that the die roll was three or bigger. So those are examples of events. Turns out we're going to take probabilities of events. Before I get to defining probabilities, let's look at uh, one more uh, definition and example. So, um, definition. We'll say uh, two events, say E1 and E2, are said to be mutually exclusive. E sub 1 intersected E sub 2 is equal to the empty set. So their intersection is the empty set. That is, these events have nothing in common. If one of the events happens, the other one could not happen. Let's look at an example. Uh, so let's say that a die is rolled. Um, again, our sample space is the set of outcomes. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. We're going to let E1 be an event. It's going to be the event that contains the outcome of one and two. E2, that's going to be an event. It's uh, containing the outcomes four and six. And E3, that's going to be an event. It's going to be the outcomes two, three, and five. Now, the thing to note is that E1 and E2 are mutually exclusive events. you can see that if you take a look to see what's in common, there isn't anything. So their intersection between E1 and E2 is the empty set. However, E1 and E3 are not mutually exclusive events.
And that's easy to see as well, because if you take the intersection between E1 and E2, you see that they, uh, E1 and E3, they have the outcome of the die roll being a 2 in common, so their intersection is not the empty set. We're now ready to give the definition of probability. A probability is, let's give it a symbol, P is a set function so what we mean by a set function is a function whose input values are sets and um, in particular whose domain is the set of events from a random experiment that satisfy the fault. So there's three things that a probability must satisfy. The first thing is that the probability of an event is sandwiched in between, this is a number, and it's sandwiched in between 0 and 1. Okay. Where, uh, where, I'll say this, for all events e. any event uh, so a probability is how it comes a real number and that real number is somewhere between 0 and 1 it could be 0 or it could be 1 2 well one event is the sample space itself and the probability of the sample space that is 1 the chance that something happened is what this means it is 100% and then the third quality that a probability must satisfy is that um, if E1, E2, whatever, is a sequence of E2 and so forth, maybe forever, is a sequence. It's a sequence of hmm, too much steroids, of uh, mutually exclusive events. And what's meant there is that EI intersect EJ equals to the empty set when I is different than J. Then the probability of the unions of these EI, as I maybe runs from 1 to infinity, is equal to the sum, as I runs from 1 to infinity, of the probabilities of the uh, EIs. And uh, Sometimes we can see this uh, through pictures called Venn diagram, and I'm just going very, uh, without infinite uh, events being involved, just having two events being involved. So let's say this is E1, and this is E2. So this is my picture to somewhat describe what's being said here. 
And what I'm thinking is this box is the sample space, and the box is worth, if you will, or a piece of the box is like a piece of property, and it's worth one dollar, the probability of it, one. So it's worth one dollar. And so here, if we're saying, if we were to take this and this and combine them, take them both, and say, what's the probability of their union? There's two of them in this case. Well, what it's equal to, because they're mutually exclusive and no intersection, no overlapping, uh, the probability of the union of these two things combined, the worth of these two things combined, is the worth of this E1 plus, so that's what this sum is, the worth of E2, the probability of E2. So that's just when we have two uh, mutually exclusive events involved. That's the way that that third property comes into play. Let's look at an example. Uh, let's say a coin is split. So what am I giving an example of? What I'm giving it, uh, an example of is probability. Then, the sample space is equal to heads or tails. Now, define P, so I'm going to find uh, probability, so I need to find a set function, and it needs to work on all the subsets, if you will, of the sample space. Well, one of the subsets uh, of the sample space is the empty set. Now, probability of the empty set, we're going to find to be zero. Then P of just the set that contains H, let's define it to be one third. P of the set containing T, let's define it to be two thirds. And, and then finally, let's define P of the set containing both H and T to be equal to one. Then P is a probability. Now, uh, in this example, P is a probability uh, because it satisfies the three uh, conditions to be a probability. First of all, it's defined on uh, the set of events at the set function. The output values are between 0 and 1, or they could be 0 and 1. Um, in addition, um, the probability of the sample space is 1. And lastly, any time you take mutually exclusive events and take their union, Take the probability of that, that equals to the sum of each one of the uh, probabilities of e each event. So that will happen. Now, this is a little bit of an unusual uh, probability, maybe, uh, to what you're thinking, because in this example, the probability of getting heads was one third, and the probability of giving the tails was two thirds. So the coin that I was flipping here would be considered to not be fair. Okay? Not a fair coin. Next, I'm going to give something called a classical definition, followed up with an experimental definition of <clears throat> probability. So as a definition, again, yeah, we'll call this the classical definition. It says, um, if the sample space of a random experiment Equally likely outcomes. So what we're saying is that each outcome in the sample space is equally likely to occur. Then the probability of an event E. Okay. 
is, so the probability of E is equal to the number of uh, elements in E over the number of elements in the sample space. I'll write this down as the number of ways E can occur over the number of ways anything, any item. So that's kind of our uh, standard definition to use, and uh, most often we're in situations, a lot of times we're in situations where uh, the sample space consists of equally likely outcomes. When you have a fair coin, a fair die, you're in that situation. Well, how do you know you have a fair coin, a fair die, that you're going to have equally outcomes? Equally likely outcomes in the sample space. Well, don't those be some experimental uh, science? And in particular, we have this experimental definition for probability of an event. Here's what it says it says, uh, Here's the following. It says, um, let uh, E be uh, an event from a random experiment. Okay. Then the probability of E is equal to. Uh, but I'll, I'll say it this way. The number of times, I'll just write it this way. N of E over N. Maybe I'll write it this way. The number of times, over n, where n represents the number of times the experiment The experimental definition of the probability of event is this. You do the random experiment and you see if the event happened. And you do the random experiment again, you see if the event happened. That's your interesting kind of probability. And you continue to do the experiment over and over and over again, keeping count of how many times you do the experiment and how many times the event happened in the uh, sequence of the times that you did the experiment. And that fraction, if you keep doing the experiment forever, but again, the number of times you do the experiment go uh, on to infinity. But that, uh, that limit of that fraction is the probability of the event. So if you're flipping a coin, you flip a coin, you do it once, you see what you got, heads or tails. Let's say we're trying to find the probability of getting heads. And then you flip it again, nope, but you got heads or tails. Out of two times, how many times did you get heads? And you keep flipping the coin, go on forever. And as you get bigger and bigger and bigger numbers, if the coin is fair, what you'll find is that the ratio of the number of times you got ahead over the number of times that you did the experiment will get closer and closer to one half if the coin is fair. If the coin is not fair by doing this experiment, you'll find out, um, by, by doing this forever, uh, you'll find out what the probability of getting heads is. 
Well, before I raise this side, uh, I, we are going to be assuming a lot of times that we're in a position where we're using this classical definition in that the sample space uh, consists of equally likely events. And so we're going to build theory for probability a lot of times based on uh, this occurring. And so um, counting the number of ways E can occur over the number in the sample space, counting is going to be important. So we're now going to look at some counting principles. We are going to look at that, but I want to uh, do a quick example of this definition using classical definition, using a coin being tossed. So first I'll do that. So an example of this classical definition is that, uh, not a coin, but a die is rolled. So um, a die is rolled. So we know the sample place consists of that one, one, two, three, four, five, and six. Oops. And someone might say, what is the probability that you got three, four, five, or six? Well, we think of the die being a fair die, every outcome being equally likely. So use this classical definition. This is the number in the set. 3, 4, 5, and 6 over the number in the sample space. And that's equal to 4 out of 6, so it's 2 thirds. So 2 thirds of the time when you roll a fair die, you're going to get an outcome that's 3 or bigger. Also, the probability of an even number. Two, four, six. Well, very easily, I'm going to say, well, using this classical definition, if every outcome is equally likely to occur, we have fair die, is what we're saying, then this is equal to the number in the event that we're trying to find the probability of, the number of ways that can happen. So, the number of ways that you can get an even outcome when you roll the die is three, over the number of possible outcomes is six. Possible outcome is six, so a half. So, if you got a fair die, half the time you expect the outcome to be uh, an even number. All right. Uh, again, as I said, this definition, classical definition, is dependent on counting. So let's look at some basic. Uh, let's look at some principles of counting. First thing on the list is something called the generalized counting principle. It's called basic counting principle. Some people call this the generalized uh, sequential um, principle of counting. And so here's what it says. It says, if um, event A sub 1 can occur in N sub 1 ways, and for each of these N sub 1 um, ways, event so A sub 2 can occur in N sub 2 number of ways. And for each of these N sub 1 times N sub 2 ways, event A sub 3 can occur in n sub 3 ways, and so forth, up to uh, 
up to, so give me one second, and for each of these n sub 1, n sub 2, times n sub 2, times, all the way up to times n sub r minus 1 ways, event a sub r can occur in n sub r ways, then the sequence of events A sub 1, A sub 2, and all the way up to A sub R can occur in N sub 1 times N sub 2 times all the way up to N sub R number of ways. Let me uh, very quickly give you an example. So this is a very rudimentary Mickey Mouse type of example. Example, uh, a diner offers a blue plate special that consists of one meat, one veggie, one drink. How many blue plate specials are possible? What specials are possible uh, if so there's something here to further describe? Uh, so we got a list what kind of meats, what kind of veggies are available, what kind of drinks are available, what kind of desserts are available. So we have uh, the meats. Available are, let's say, beef, chicken, pork, and lamb. If uh, the veggies available. Desserts available are pecan pie and brownies. Man, I have to choose one, so that's terrible. Might not have to be able to get a new plate special because of that restriction on desserts. Well, anyway, 
So we want to know how many blue plate specials are possible. And the answer is, is we can think of this as a sequence of events of grading to grade the blue plate special. So you're going down maybe a buffet line, and you get to the meat section, and you say, well, I, uh, uh, the person walking behind the counter says, which meat would you like? And so here, I'm thinking the sequence of events to do is to choose a meat. And so how many meats do we have to choose from? Well, we've got one, two, three, four. So there are four options here. Then the next sequence is to pick a veggie. Well, how many uh, options do we have for veggies? Three. And then we've got to pick a drink. How many options do we have for drink? One, two, three, four, five. And then finally, we've got to pick a dessert. There's two options for that. Here, uh, so this is my answer for thinking of the sequence of events. And so uh, for each one of the four ways I can pick a meat, there are three ways to pick a veg veggie. That gives us 12 possible ways to move on from having a meat and a veggie on our plate. And for each one of those 12 ways, there's five ways to drink, so forth. And so we multiply these together. So four times three times five times two. Uh, let's see, I think that's 120. So there are 120 blue plate specials. Next thing I want to talk about is what a permutation is. Well, it's a definition. A permutation is uh, a list. I should say a word like that. Is an ordered list. Order which we list that. Of N uh, objects. Okay. Now, often we're going to have N distinct objects. Okay? So um, here, as an example, uh, given the objects in the set. I'll just write them in set for taste. So my objects are the elements of the set A, B, C, and D. Then <clears throat> let's say C, B, A, D is a permutation of these objects. Now, something that helps us count the number of permutations has to do with this notation. So if we let n be a natural number, then uh, n factorial is denoted by n with an exclamation point following, so that's n factorial, and here's how it's defined. So n factorial is defined to be n times uh, n minus 1 times n minus 2 times, you keep going down until you get down to 1. So it's a quick example. We so said, what's 5 factorial? 
So that's 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, and that ends up being 120. We saw that in the group of what's special. Another example is 6 factorial, and that's 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, and that ends up being 720. So, of course, 6 factorial is 5 times more than, uh, I'm sorry, 6 factorial is 6 times more than 5 factorial. And so uh, factorials get to be really big numbers pretty quickly. 10 factorial is a big number. And in terms of a convention, so the formulas uh, will work out, we define 0 factorial to be equal to 1. 0 factorial is 1. Um, why are we talking about factorials? Well, as a fact, the number of uh, permutations Of, and here I'm going to say this explicitly, of n distinct objects is n factorial. Okay, let's look at an example. So, uh, the number of permutations of the letters A, B, and C is, okay, so you note that we have three distinct objects here, A, B, C. They're distinct, different from each other. And you want to know how many ways can you have a, uh, an ordered listing of them. And so, uh, these three. So, the answer is three factorial, because there's three of them, factorial, that's what three is about, says, which is three times two times one, of course, which is six. So, that's a small number. I can write those down. Namely, so I'm going to write them in a systematic way. We could have a, B, C, so that's one. Then we could have A, so I'm thinking A is first in this kind of category. We could have C, B. That's all the ways in which A could be listed first, the, the permutations of these three letters. Then we could have B being first, so it could be B, A, C, or B, C, A. And then lastly, we could have C first, so it could be C, uh, A, B, or C, B, A. And so those are the six. Now, as a definition, so we're talking about permuta permutations, and we have indistinct objects. There's n factorial number of permutations uh, of the indistinct objects. But uh, so a permutation of indistinct objects taken r at a time is, again, an ordered listing So it's an ordered listing. So the order is important of R of these n distinct objects. So as an example, so uh, given the set A, B, C, 
and D, so I got four options. Then, AB is a permutation of these four objects taken two at a time. And so is, let's say, um, BD. Okay. So not only can you have ordering, uh, distinguishing between uh, uh, the outcomes here for the permutations, but also which objects are involved. Okay. So uh, it's kind of the, maybe a little bit complicated to figure out how many uh, permutations taken art at a time are possible for many distinct objects. But we got a fact that tells us what it is. So the number of permutations of indistinct objects taken are at a time. Is, well, it's denoted by P of N comma R, and it's equal to N factorial over N minus R factorial, and that's equal to N, so I'm not going to go through this, but I guess I am. So it's N times N minus 1 times N minus 2, keep going down, and at some point you get to N minus R plus 1, and then the next number is N minus R and then you go all the way down to 1 inside the multiplication. And that's over n minus r times n minus r minus 1, all the way down to 1. And what happens is this n minus r multiplied down to 1, and this n minus r all the way down multiplied to 1, they are common factors, so they cancel. So I run out of room. So I'll write over here. So that's equal to oh gosh. Oh, that's very heavy. So that's equal to okay. N times N minus one all the way down to multiply to be N minus R plus one. That's the number of permutations of indistinct objects taken over at time. So uh, let's look at an example. Uh, so a club has uh, 13 members, elections for president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer are to be made. How many election outcomes are possible if, uh, if each member is eligible for each office?
I'm going to do this in two ways. First way, I'm going to use the permutation. And you'll really see that they're both the same ways. But when I say the permutation pointer, here's what I mean. We got 13 different people. And what we're doing is we're trying to elect officers for president, vice president, uh, secretary, and treasurer. And so if I just list four people, um, say I say Al, Bob, uh, Carl, and uh, Dan. And that, what that would indicate for those four people is that Al was president, uh, Bob was vice president maybe, um, Carl uh, was uh, I guess secretary, and then uh, Dan was treasurer. So the order in which I list them is indicating which position that they're holding. So if I said we had Bob, uh, uh, Carl, Dan, uh, and Al, that was a different outcome than the previous one I mentioned, because in, the, in the, the latter one I mentioned, Bob was president as opposed to Al. So even though the same uh, four elected officials, four elected club members, uh, there was a different outcome because who held what post. So we see orders important. So that makes me think of permutations. So the, what I'm thinking is if we got 13 members, uh, we want to see how many listings there are of four of them. I mean, uh, different order listings of four of them are possible. That would uh, translates to the possible outcomes for the elections. So the answer here is 13 factorial over 9 factorial, which is the same thing as 13 times 12 times 11 times 10, whatever number that is. The second way is the basic, the generalized basic principle of counting. So here's my thing. We've got a president to fill, we've got a vice president to fill, we've got a, a secretary position to fill, we've got a president position to fill. And so how many ways can the president uh, position be filled from the club members? 13. Now, for each one of those 13 ways, how many ways can a vice president be filled? Well, the person who's elected for president cannot serve as vice president. So there are 12 members in the club that are available for vice president. And once the president and vice president have filled, there are 11 members here, and there are 10 members here. And so the answer here is 13 times 12 times 11 times 10. You get the same answer. All right, so that's an example. Okay. Next thing I want to cover is what a combination and the definition. A combination here is the definition we're talking about having indistinct. Um, but I'm going to take R at a time. Is a collection of R objects from or out of. In distinct objects. So, as an example, uh, given the collection A, B, C, and D, then A, B is a uh, combination. 
these four objects taken two at a time. And so is um, let's say B D. Now A B is a combination of four of these objects taken two at a time. And A B is the same thing as B A. So the collection A B is the same thing as the collection of B A. You just take it. Two of those objects, you've got the same ones, it doesn't matter in terms of the combination of uh, what the order is that you list the objects that you're taking. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> when order is not distinguishing, we're looking at combinations, and we have a formula for the number of combinations of indistinct objects taken part of time. So let me list that as a fact. The number of combinations of indistinct objects taken or at a time Same thing is being denoted by n of r and given by n over r, if you will, in this parenthesis. And given by, so n choose r, that's the way that's read, n choose r is equal to n factorial over n minus r factorial, the same thing as the number of permutations. Uh, and then involved in the denominator is a factor of r factorial. So there's a lot fewer. Uh, combinations that permutations. Yes, of course there are. Because permutations, the order is important. Um, and so there would be, uh, even when you choose R objects at the end, okay, there would be lots of ways to distinguish the arrangements of those R objects if the order was important. We're talking about permutations. As a matter of fact, the number of ways for each one of the combinations, if you had order being important to make permutations, the number of permutations from each one of those combinations of, of objects is exactly, if you have R uh, objects in your combinations, the number of ways to rearrange them is R factorial. And so the permutations, the number of permutations are this, it is too big by a factor of R factorial. That's why you have this involved. So as an example, um, if we look at the set A, B, C, D, the number of permutations, no, I'm sorry, combinations of these four objects taken two at a time is by our formula. It is 4 choose 2, which is equal to 4 factorial or 4 minus 2 factorial or 2 factorial. <clears throat> and that's 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 over 2 times 1 times 2 times 1, which equals to, well, that's uh, this 2 times 1 here, cancel this 2 times 1 here, and we're left with 12 over 2, so that's 6. 6 is not that many on this list. So we could have. A, B, A, C, so I'm going to start with one A, and A, D. So we're talking about combinations. So out of the four, A, B, C, D, those are the combinations that have A. Then you could have B, not A, so B, B, A is the same thing as A, B. So we have B, C, and B, D. 
And then lastly, you could have C, the same thing as DC. So those are the six combinations that are possible. Let's look at uh, one last example. So let's say a club has uh, 13 members. And would like to form a committee of four. How many possible committees can be formed? different committees. Okay, the answer is, so in this time, if I say, well, on the committee was Al, Bob, Carl, and Dan. And I said, well, on the committee, uh, we have Dan, uh, Carl, Bob, and Al. Well, that's the same committee. It doesn't matter how I list them. So the order of listing the members is not distinguishing of the committee. So we use combinations here. So the answer is, it is 13 choose 4. So what is that? That's 13 factorial over 9 factorial, 4 factorial. Remember this 9 is obtained by 13 minus 4. So 13 factorial uh, over 9 factorial times 4 factorial. And I'll do a little work with this very quickly. That's 13 times 12 times 11 times 10. And then the 9 through 1 multiplied together eliminates or cancels with the 9 times 1 multiplied together in the bottom. And so then I have 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 here. And 4 times 3 is 12, so that eliminates with this. And then uh, 2 goes into 10 5 times. So my answer here is 13 times 11 times 5, whatever that is. Lastly, we'll end with this, so just as a comment. Uh, we use permutations, uh, permutations, when order is important, is distinguishing, and combinations when order it's not distinguishing. That concludes our first video lecture. Thank you very much for your time and patience.